uh, as you know that we have been discussing about the engineering materials and uh, we will continue the same today. So, today's lecture is lecture number 4 and uh, it will be again on engineering materials. Now, you see we have already discussed about the type of materials normally we use in engineering practice that is ferrous and non-ferrous metals and we have a, a discussion in the last class about this one, about all those materials. Now, today uh, you see, uh, if you look at the slide, you can see the heading is non-metals. So, there are numerous non-metals that are actually in engineering practice. However, we will be discussing about the those non-metals which are very common in engineering practice. Now, why you use the non-metals uh, or why it finds its use in the machine design? Because uh, one thing is that normally the non-metals are uh, what you call it is a low cost materials, it has got the flexibility and also you know it has got a good resistance to heat and electricity. Now, one of the very important non-metal that is timber. So, this timber is relatively a very low cost material and it has it is a good elastic it has good elastic and frictional properties. However, it is very bad conductor of heat and electricity. So, always you will be finding out that uh, due to these two aspects particularly the first one the timbers are used in various uh, engineering applications. Moreover, uh, what is happening that we use a timber normally you know in the cases of uh, even uh, water lubricated bearings, foundry patterns okay. and also you will see the normal structures are also sometimes made up of timbers uh, and uh, this are the major uses of timber in the machine design. You know in certain cases also what happens for some temporary machine elements timbers are also used as to manufacture temporary machine elements uh, not in a very true sense of what we understand in general as machine element not in that way some wheels or some shafts or all these sort of temporary devices are sometimes also made of timber. Now, we go to another one which is leather. As you know this is also widely used in engineering for its flexibility and wear resistance characteristics mostly. Now, uh, always that leathers are used as a pure form uh, is not the case. What happens that the leathers are also impregnated with some other materials okay. Sometimes you know it can be impregnated with uh, some uh, cords made of nylon etcetera and also it can be impregnated with some other alloying materials also to give it a more strength etcetera. However, the leather finds an application uh, as a non-metal in machine design and one of the widest used of leather what we can think of is the bale drives. I think all of you have seen the bale drives and uh, if you look at the bale drives you will be seeing the bales are mostly made up of leather. Well, when we talk about these bale drives we will learn more about the other materials, but however the leather is one of the very common material for bale drive washers and some other similar applications, gaskets okay, sometimes are made of leather type, but mostly rubbers and other materials, but these are also can be used in certain aspects uh, for, uh, uh, for use as an machine element. <coughs> now, another situation or another uh, situation comes into picture that is the non-metals which are the rubbers. 
Now, as because uh, this rubber has high bulk modulus, uh, this also used has got an advantage in machine element designs and it is used again for drive elements, sealing, vibration, isolations, again gaskets in the pipelines and many more. To mention about the rubber, one should say that the rubber is also available with uh, various other impregnated elements inside it, this particular uh, pure rubber material to render strength and other properties which uh, could be useful for uh, typical applications. So, or in other words depending upon the applications various forms of rubbers, rubbers are also in use. So, we go for other non-metals and this one is what we call as a plastics. Plastics I think do not need any introduction in the modern day and uh, the use of plastics again in different forms are widely accepted as an very good alternate machine element material. Nowadays, if you see any machine elements, okay, uh, if you consider simply a car say, now starting from its maybe from its uh, structure, the body covering okay, and the inner mouldings, inner interior decorations, everything are being made of plastics. Why? because it has a very good strength as well as it has a very low weight compared to metals. So, that the ratio of strength to weight is quite high in case of the plastic. So, thereby what happens to reduce the weight of the machine elements, one can uh, think of the plastics uh, for, for typical designs. Now, what are the plastics? You just have a look. These are synthetic materials which can be molded into desired shapes under pressure and this uh, requires with or without application of heat means you can make it to the desired shapes. Pressure is required always, but it can be without heat or it can be molded with heat. As I told you that these are extensively used in various industrial applications for their properties. What I did not mention right now, the properties are uh, like this. It is a corrosion resistance. Uh, it has got a dimensional stability and relatively low cost. Okay? That means, dimensional stability you understand that means, its uh, effect onto the expansion etcetera are relatively very less. Uh, compared to the other uh, metals. Now, although we call as a common word as plastics, it has got the two names. As you can see, there are names comes out in this form, thermosetting plastics and thermoplastics. So, depending upon the manufacturing and the this particular property, you can have the thermosetting plastics and the thermoplastics. What are these two? Let us see that when you talk about the thermosetting plastics, then this thermosetting plastics are formed under heat and pressure. That means, here is one case what we discussed earlier case heat with or without pressure. Now, it requires a heat, I am sorry, pressure is required heat or without heat. Now, in this case, we have to utilize heat and pressure. It initially softens and uh, with increasing heat and pressure polymerization takes place. So, basically uh, one way this is also called different grades of polymers. This results in hardening of the material and uh, this plastic cannot be deformed or remolded again under heat and pressure. That means, it gets a permanent set. So, uh, once you take up this type of thermo setting plastics, then you apply heat and pressure to give a mold 
uh, shape and once the mold shape is final then you cannot retry back any other shape under application of heat or pressure once it hardens. Now, what are the exam what are the examples of thermosetting plastics? You can see the phenol formaldehyde which is the name and very commonly known as bakelite. So, bakelite you know it is a very heat resistance material and also quite hard and it has uh, wide used in electrical appliances. Then phenol uh, for fural what is called durite, then epoxy resins and phenolic resins. As a matter of fact the epoxy resins so if we talk about these epoxy resins are used for you know uh, you know the common name uh, which you use in the uh, market is aryl light or some sort of things those are all the epoxy resins and as a matter of fact epoxy resins with a proper amount of chemical treatment that is called hardness you can uh, really make out different shapes when different you can make the molds and from which you can pour this epoxy resins and get varieties of uh, machine elements having different shapes. So, very and, and if you uh, mix up with this some other uh, fibers glass fibers and uh, other uh, carbon fibers etcetera it gives an attractive strength property also and that is the reason the epoxy resins are very widely used for uh, mold purposes. Uh, one of the situations uh, what I just told you uh, are uh, you can see are being uh, utilized very much uh, particularly in the laboratories when you do some experimental setups then you will be finding out that epoxy resins added with the uh, carbon fibers or the glass fibers will be uh, utilized to make some laminates or setups having different mold shapes. The next one is the thermoplastics. Thermoplastics do not become hard with the application of heat and pressure and no chemical change takes place. They remain soft at elevated temperatures until they are hardened by cooling. This can be remelted and remolded by application of heat and pressure. So, that means the you understand these thermoplasts uh, actually are relatively softer material than the thermosetting. Now, the advantage is that this thermoplastics can be again remelted and remolded by application of heat and pressure. Now, here you can see some names that are the cellulose nitrate that is called celluloid, then polythene polyvinyl acetate and polyvinyl chloride PVC. So, if we if we the once you would see the name PVC do you understand that uh, what is the use of the PVC? You have seen in the everyday life we talk about PVC pipes one of the um, one of the very modern pipelines uh, made of plastics basically these thermoplastics which are widely used in uh, any water pipelines etcetera where you can find out its application because if it is lightweight once again to say cheap and mostly the corrosion resistance you by long uses you do not have a iron rustings formed on the pipeline. So, thereby it is an attractive situation for the uh, for transportation of drinking water etcetera. However, uh, some questions sometimes is being raised uh, regarding the transportations of waters through PVC pipes, uh, particularly for the drinking waters. Uh, of course, the most suitable one uh, should be the stainless steel, uh, but st still that part if we just omit out for the time being, then we find that the PVC has got an excellent applications in particularly in water pipelines what you have seen in your everyday life. Other than that what happens that there are so many PVC components are utilized in uh, making the uh, different type of machine design elements. 
because the reason comes out to be the same corrosion resistance attractive weight uh, strength to weight ratio that is one of the very beautiful features. However, you know uh, because nowadays what happens that all the machine elements which are made of the PVC or the plastics in general if we see then uh, these are somewhat an use and throw type of things that means you normally you do not repair in the plastic products. If it is thermosetting you know that it cannot be repaired because it cannot be remolded. Uh, again all the PVCs can be remelted, remolded, but normally what happens all the machine elements made out of plastics are in general uh, use and throw types. That means, uh, that means that is the reason what happens the maintenance for the say any cars or other things has become very cheap and fast means you just simply change the components. Of course, uh, if it is uh, plastic components. And at the same time what I would like to say that they use the car manufacturers that particularly are using day by day more and more type of this type of um, uh, plastic uh, you know machine elements just to reduce the weight. So, thereby you have a good amount of fuel efficiency. So, <coughs> these are the uses of the plastics and the two types of plastics already I have told and as a matter of fact. Uh, there are this type of situations are endless, endless situations will come into picture whenever we talk of the plastics. Now, uh, for this particular course of machine design, I think that the mention of the material plastics is good enough. At least you have uh, some ideas that how you can use plastics for different machine elements. However, uh, one has to resort to a uh, huge amount of you know uh, literature. So, if you really look for the uh, entire range of plastics that are being used for design of machine elements. So, if we uh, talk about very quickly what we have gathered about engineering materials, then uh, you just very quickly uh, go up to the last class even. So, you uh, we understand that we could have we have the important ferrous materials are cast iron, wrought iron and steel. Before that you know the ferrous metals, non metals and non ferrous materials. Okay? These three are uh, widely used and for all these trees we do have the important uh, mechanical properties to learn. So, uh, cast iron, wrought iron and steel we have learned. We have learned about different types of cast irons and their uses. We know about the grey cast iron, white cast iron, malleable cast iron, then graphite, uh, nodular graphite cast iron, austenitic cast iron uh, and abrasion resistant cast iron. So, you have seen that so many varieties of cast irons are there. Uh, what we have just picked up? Uh, very few uh, which are uh, is, a, is a normal materials uh, which are used in machine design uh, design of machine elements. You can have the cast irons you know you can have the cast iron uh, uh, sorry wrought irons uh, which is a very pure iron and the steel one of the major uh, ferrous materials which is having an wide range of uh, you know alloying elements and thereby you get the different type of steel. So, if it is plain carbon steel uh, that means you do have the uh, carbons only and very uh, less amount of um, other materials I mean other elements. However, there are <coughs> nickel, chromium, tungsten, vanadium, manganese, silicon, cobalt, molybdenum these are the uh, alloying elements put up into steel to make alloy steels, one of the very widely used steels in engineering design. So, about the non ferrous metals we have learned about aluminum, its varieties like duralium, Y alloy, magnelium, then we have learned about the copper alloys which are also uh, very useful. Then 
uh, out of this copper alloys we have one brass another is the bronze we have got an another variety called gunmetal and this today's lecture we have learned about some of the non metals like timber leather rubber and uh, last but not the least the plastics which are widely used as i told you now after coming over the plastics we have learned about the thermosetting plastics and we have learned about the thermoplastics now we come down to one of the important things that is the mechanical properties of common engineering materials why we talk about the mechanical properties of materials the reason is very simple uh, you know that to be in a very very simple case we design a machine element the primary situation comes out to be like that that stress equals to load divided by area that all of you know now machine design you will be finding out will be concerned with basically finding out the a means the dimensions of a machine element to be very simple in this thing i mean simple in design considerations so what we know we know the load onto a machine element that is that one has to know because you know the application uh, and as you know the application you know the loading pattern you know the load so thereby to determine the dimension of the machine element to take up that load what we require we require the value of the stress now in this case how we define stress means in this case we define the stress means the value of the material stress at which it fails okay so once we know the material property at which the material fails then immediately we can find out the dimensions of the machine element so what we understand that if it is in addition to this particular stress what we are talking about you have other mechanical properties which will be somewhat if i consider as an synonymous to the stresses are also responsible for breaking the material or for the failure of the material uh, in a better sense if we talk about the failure of the material under different situations as a matter of fact what we understand that if we consider a load which is static or quasi static means very slowly if you are giving a load to a machine element then what we normally will be calling as a static load then our uh, our material property which will be very important is the one of the situations is that the yield point or the proportional limit what we called about okay there is a difference we will be coming shortly okay to discuss these things anyway uh, what happens that uh, in that way if it is an sudden impact then we will be finding out some other properties are important if we find out that the machine element is acted upon by a fluctuating or a variable load instead of a static load then some other material property is important so if it is uh, in the similar line if we consider the material is under a, a constant load at elevated temperatures or something like that some other material properties are also important so we should know some of the mechanical properties uh, or at least we have some understanding of the mechanical properties because when we will be considering the design aspects or when we will be designing then we should keep those material properties in mind uh, to use it effectively or for an effective use in a machine design now the first and foremost of that what we understand is the elasticity this is the property of a material to regain its original shape after deformation when the external forces are removed all materials are, re, uh, are removed all materials are plastic to some extent but 
the degree varies. For example, both mild steel and rubber are elastic materials, but steel is more elastic than rubber. Now, uh, once we talk about the elasticity and the associated term we can see is also the plasticity. This is associated with the permanent deformation of material when the stress level exceeds the yield point. Under plastic conditions, materials ideally deform without any increase in stress. So, here we find that uh, we can talk about the uh, this particular curve. You know, you can see this curve of the stress strain diagram elastic perfectly elastic materials. That means, what is the perfectly sorry perfectly plastic material. Now, conventionally we know that if we plot a stress strain diagram, then it comes something like this and it goes like this. Uh, okay, I just draw it in a bold line something like this. Now, in this case, when you are considering the situations as elasticity and plasticity, then we know that somewhere this is the yield point. What we consider? This is the yield point. Within the yield point, we consider the material to be elastic. That means, the definition is that if you apply a force and then release it, it comes back to the original shape. So, that is the elastic region and when we go to the plastic region, there is a permanent deformation and the idealized situation is what is shown in the figure. You can see that it goes as a straight line. So, this basically from here onwards, this is all the plastic zone what you are getting. So, this is a plastic zone of the material and this curve is an idealized figure. Now, uh, in this respect, uh, what happens that normally if we draw the stress strain curve, I understand that you remember the different loads, this is a stress and this is the strain. Now, what you know that this stress we call, you should know we call it as an engineering stress. Why engineering stress? Because if we consider the stress expression, then this sigma, the value of sigma, okay, I write out here, is something load divided by area. Now, when we talk about engineering stress, then what happens that we do not consider the change of area taking place due to the deformation. Suppose, if you are having a tension test, okay, then this is a typical tension test curve what I have plotted over here. Then the area will be gradually reducing and thereby P by A will be more and more. It will not be following this particular path. However, it has been seen experimentally that if we consider up to the yield point, really the change in area is so small that engineering stress and the true stress other one if we consider the change in area means if I write a c then the sigma 2 means actual area a actual if we consider then you will be considering every time a change in the sigma true sigma. Now, here the true sigma will be quite appreciable, I am still I am drawing and very exaggerated that moment it comes over like this. That means, when the area becomes very small at the fracture point, then the true stress will shoot up that is quite evident from the expression. However, now in the most engineering situations for the design, we consider this zone to be a failure zone, is not it? Because normally we will be taking up the material property up to the yield point. Now, another part what comes into the mind is that 
you can see that when you consider a stress strain diagram sigma epsilon in the textbooks you might be seen something like the curves like comes like this where we consider as an upper yield point and as a lower yield point. But if you do the experiment you will be hardly seeing this type of phenomena and I uh, as a matter of fact these phenomena are mostly I mean very prominent for the mild steel uh, materials and that too if the strain rate is very slow. So, if it is having a low strain rate then and then only you can come across this type of higher yield point and lower yield point. Nevertheless, uh, we consider a general stress strain diagram of the nature as I just drawn earlier. So, let us consider this general stress strain diagram. I draw, have drawn the earlier diagram because you should not make the confusion that that is a general train that particular one is a typical one for the uh, you know uh, mild steel sort of materials and that too at the low strain rate you must be understanding that particular part. Otherwise, if you look at the uh, slide once again then you can see that normal curves will be as I have drawn over here. Here we consider a yield point basically before yield point we do have a point called the proportional limit means what is the difference proportional limit is perfectly the point till which the material is elastic and yield point means already very small amount of deformation has set in although we know the material property based on yield points are the one which is widely used and another point we also utilize in the machine design is this ultimate stress ultimate stress okay ut so this is ultimate stress and this is yield point stress and this is the breaking stress now in some cases what happens that uh, or if you get a diagram of this type of uh, this type of nature then it is very difficult for one if it is very difficult for one to get exactly the yield point because the the transition of linear to this nonlinear situations in actual curve is very difficult to find out so you must be knowing just a recapitulation i am giving you that if we have a sigma epsilon plot just as we have seen right now uh, i am drawing onto a blank sheet uh, you, you we find out that yield point breaking point uh, sorry breaking point and the ultimate point etc but as you can see that it is very difficult in actual practice to find out that where this line this linear zone has gone up to just entered the plastic zone. So, here it is being done in this way that you draw the linear zone and take a certain amount of offset over this and taking this point you draw a line parallel to the original parallel line and then you get a point like this means intersection of this curve and the parallel line gives you a word sometimes it referred to as proof stress sometimes it preferred to as also offset yield point. So, this is one of a very convenient way to determine the yield point of a material in cases. How much should be the offset? Offset is normally 0 0.1 percent to 0 
2 percent. However, uh, this particular choice of value uh, is also determined by the designer who is taking this material property for his design. Try to derive the values from the results obtained in simple tensile test. So, that is the reason in all the courses the students are exposed at least to a material testing test namely as tensile test which gives you the important properties like yield point and ultimate stress values because these are widely used in design and that we will be discussing in the course and uh, I have told you some already their utilities in deriving other material properties. Well, once we have some idea about this plasticity and the elasticity, then uh, let us see another equation. This equation will be taking up in the uh, after one or two lectures. Now, this is called Mrs. Hanke, Miss as Hanke criteria. This gives a very good starting point for plasticity analysis. Means, if a material is acted upon by the principal stresses in a three dimensional conditions, that means, if we consider a three dimensional case, you can uh, understand that uh, we consider, uh, we will be considering something like this. So, say sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, whatever may be the load we can compute, you can see later on that sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are the principal stresses onto an material for a very small infinitesimal small cube. So, in that case what is happening that if we consider the fact then once you get this sigma 1, sigma 2 then this gives a relationship which from which you can predict and that what will be the initiation of the plastic analysis or plasticity analysis and this you know the tensile yield point. Then you uh, go back to the go to the next slide. Here also uh, it is called an indentation test also which gives the uh, you know the examples of plastic flow. If it is an material you can see onto a body uh, some sphere sort of is acted upon by the load and you find out the deformations which is if you measure that is the deformation is something like that whose diameter is 2 a. Then in a very simplified model, one can say that condition for plastic flow, so P divided by pi s square that means P only the stress available should be greater than the P m the stress where P m is the flow pressure. Pressure means that unit is also having same of the stress sort of things. So, this is also a condition by indentation test one can say that this is the condition for the plastic flow. So, that is we understand that the stress where you we can have a plastic flow. So, we uh, we can understand that two situations are coming into picture that if we have the plastic flow then then you are having this uh, Mises Henke criteria and also a uh, simple model for the plastic flow which gives p by pi s square greater than p m that is a flow pressure. Now, other important properties are one is a hardness. The property of the material that enables it to resist permanent deformation, penetration, indentation etcetera are called the hardness. The size of indentations by various types of indenters are the measure of hardness. You know 
uh, this enables resistance resist permanent deformation penetration indentation etc so you know the normally uh, you might, you will be hearing that uh, material is surface hardened and other like an word like surface hardened the situation something like comes the outer surface of a machine elements are uh, exposed that means it is prone to accidental loads on coming onto it so thereby it might create an indentation penetrations etc what just has been told to you so uh, what is the measure the measure is primarily done through an hardness test so if we find out the indentation uh, or the penetration what is being taken up or uh, what is uh, what is being caused onto the machine element gives the some sort of hardness number and that hardness number is the is the measure of hardness of an engineering material by which the machine elements are made of what are those tests you know that these tests will be if you might be doing or uh, or you have done that is called brinell hardness test rockwell hardness test vickers hardness so there is a vickers the diamond pyramid test so in all the cases whether it is brittle uh, brinell hardness or a rockwell hardness test or a vickers hardness test everywhere you will be finding out that what is happening that some sort of indenters are there and the machine is applying a load onto the material to be tested through the indenter then what you will be getting just you have seen the model of the plastic flow in the earlier slide similarly you will be getting the indentation onto that material surface and by microscope or by some other means if you can find out what is the diameter of the indentation or the depth of the indentation then what you will be finding out you can find out a relative hardness numbers and those hardness numbers are the measure of hardness of a material so the tests give hardness numbers which are related to yield pressure as we told of the yield pressure uh, uh, that is uh, that that is particularly related by some means and uh, if you do those tests then you will be learning more about how you relate the numbers to find out the hardness of a material ductility uh, this uh, is the property of the material that enables it to be drawn out or elongate to an appreciable extent before rapture occurs. Now here uh, once again it will be a repetition of uh, somewhat and what I earlier told you about the elastic and plastic zone if you again can look into this type of graphs then what you can see this is a stress strain graph we know this particular part. So, in one word ductility is the property by which how much you can go to the plastic zone all right in one word I can say like that that means how you can elongate more and more elongate if you do not elongate then it is not a ductile. What is the measure of ductility percentage elongation or percentage reduction in area before rapture of a test specimen. That means the uh, same thing is that you can have if you take an original material if you go this is the size of the material if you take on the tension test then what happens the material will not only elongate well it will be also thin down that is this is the reduction in area 
and this is the overall increase in the length it is just a schematic view. So, how much it has elongated with respect to the original specimen is called the percentage elongation. How much reduction area means the area has reduced with respect to the original area is called the percentage reduction in area. So, this is called percentage in reduction in area. So, somehow this both these situations will give you an idea of and ductility of the material more the percentage elongation or percentage reduction in area more the material is ductile. Now, uh, here uh, the percentage elongation somewhat more than 50 per 15 percent is uh, referred to as an ductile material and percentage elongation less than 5 percent it is called an brittle material. So, uh, I think we have not yet used the word brittle material. The brittle means obviously, it will be the opposite of ductile means you do not have the property to extend under the load means it will be suddenly failing. Now, lead, copper, aluminum, mild steel are typical uh, ductile materials that one use one can name about. Now, you this similar manner this one what we call malleability it is a special case of ductility where it can be rolled into thin sheets, but it is not necessary to be strong. Here is some examples of malleability that is the lead, soft steel, wrought iron, copper, aluminum. So, it is in the diminishing malleability that means lead is the most malleable whereas, in this range of example aluminum is a least one. And uh, I think uh, one of the situations you know uh, the gold is a very good malleable material that is the reason a small amount of gold can be made into a beautiful ornament having a very light weight. So, you require a light weight uh, as an ornament otherwise the person would not feel comfortable. So, that is the reason you require a material uh, which has very small weight, but it has got a good spreadability that is a called what we call as a malleable. Now, that is the one what I just talking about is a brittleness, it is opposite to ductility. So, if you consider uh, a cast iron, then these are a very brittle material. So, uh, well uh, not this part, okay. if we consider then if you again we I draw this particular diagram, then cast iron will just go may be little up to that one majority of the cast iron side I should say and it will just break over here. And in general the cast irons thereby are called about the brittle material that means these do not have any elastic I mean any property of plasticity that means it cannot simply elongate under the action of load. So, percentage elongation when it is less than 5 percent it is called an brittle material as I told you and uh, uh, this definition is already uh, I think I have told, but let me read it out once again it is opposite to ductility brittle materials show little deformation before fracture and failure occurs suddenly without any warning. So, this is a very important in uh, design. So, the mach machine elements which will be normally uh, taken up the shock loads or the vibrating loads should not be made of cast iron uh, because it will just break without any deformation and thereby it will be an catastrophic. Okay. So, cast iron, glass, ceramics or all these are the brittle materials which we know. Then another important property is called the resilience. What is resilience? This is the property of the material that enables 
it to resist shock and impact by storing energy. The measure of resilience is the strain energy absorbed per unit volume. So, what we can see that an idea I mean uh, idealized curve is that what I have uh, what is being drawn over here. Okay. So, it has got a linear displacement. So, what is the area under the curve? Half base into altitude. So, we consider the once we have stretched now plus this is up to the yield point if you have stretched up to the yield point or the proportional limit what is we can call half p is a load part and delta l is a deformation delta l is a deformation what has been i have just plotted here as deformation so delta l will be the change in the length we call this is a delta total deformation so, if it is deformation is considered as a delta L over a length L, okay, specimen of length L, this is a specimen length, then half P into delta L. So, half we simplify divide by A by L A. So, we get is you can understand P by A is a stress and delta L by L is a strain and A into L A the area of cross section gives you the volume. So, if I divided it by volume, then we get the half delta sigma. So, this is the expression for strain energy per unit volume and this sometimes is also called the coefficient of resilience. So, this is the property by which you know one can um, absorb the energy all right that is shock energy. In the similar manner if we consider if we consider a material property, this is also called the toughness. So, toughness means this is the property which enables a material to be twisted, bent or stretched under impact load or high stress before rupture. It may be considered to be the ability of the material to absorb energy in the plastic zone. The measure of toughness is the amount of energy absorbed after being stressed up to the point of fracture. You know uh, once again if I uh, try to draw this aspect, I have already told you say this is a strain energy. So, if we talk about this energy per unit volume, we considered the absorbing capacity as the word by resilience. Now, instead of that, if we consider the entire stress strain diagram up to the point of rapture, this P say point of rapture and you go up to this point and you take up the entire area, all right, then this also gives you the total amount of energy absorbed and this comparison for different materials will give you the toughness of the material. Say you have another material which breaks like this, a typical example of something like an brittle. It can have a go high, but it suddenly breaks, do not go much into the plastic zone. So, this is again the area for another material. So, if you compare this pink one and if you this is pink curve with a green shade and another one if you compare the blue curve with blue shade, then this two areas gives you a comparison of the toughness. Now, in this case how you determine the toughness, you should know that the method of determining this particular toughness are by the test something like you know, you know the impact test sorry this impact test which is called IZOT test which is or sorry Charpy C H A R Charpy test like that the tests are done for the impact test of the materials which gives you an idea of the toughness of the material. You know the other one coming out to be the creep. 
when a material is subjected to a constant load over a long period of time it undergoes a slow permanent deformation and this is termed as creep. Now, this is dependent on temperature usually at elevated temperatures creep is high. So, this is also a material phenomena whenever a uh, machine design is uh, machine element has to be designed for a load and temperature okay, for a long period of time then you know the one has to take into consideration of the creep. So, uh, here we have learned about some material properties of course, one has to do some experiments onto the material properties to find out uh, the actual values which is the ideal situation means if you want to have the material properties you should do an experiment to find out its values. However, uh, you will be finding out in later cases that uh, we do use some relationships to find out one material property from other material properties of which tensile test is the most important one which gives uh, from which we can get the idea of other material properties. However, one has to go for the hardness test to find out the hardness, one has to go for the impact test to find out the impact strength. And uh, of course, in this manner you can take out that I mean you can consider the uh, engineering tests for the to find out material properties. So, this ends our lecture about the common engineering materials. Thank you. Thank you.